1934, there was a man called Percy Shaw who was driving along the road and he was a bit of an, bit of an inventive type. He was driving along the road and it was foggy. It was on top of a hill and he knew there was a precipice down one side so he was a bit worried and he was driving along in the fog and he just couldn't see anything. It was dark as well and so he, he was driving as cautiously as he can and then suddenly these two little lights appeared in his headlights and in the distance and he was really shocked. He just slammed on his brakes and it's just as well he did because he was about to drive down the precipice. And he, being the inventive type, he thought, two eyes, and it found it was a cat. So he called his invention Cat's Eyes. And here's a picture of them, hopefully. Those are cat's eyes. And he took a long time. Log struggled to get his invention uh, accepted and it would work. By the way, it's a bit more clever than I realised it was. Um, apparently when the traffic goes over it, it squashes down so it doesn't get damaged, but also there's a little water basin inside it and when it squashes down, the water washes the glass. Quite clever really, isn't it? Um, and so God, you know, is, gives us things like this in our roads in our life to stop us from going over precipices. He gives us things which will help us to keep on the right path. Gives us things which will keep us going. And those things are principally the things we've been talking about. There's the word of God, prayer, uh, fellowship, breaking of bread and prayer. And we're on the last one now, which is prayer. But if you do these things, and if you just throw yourself into the kingdom of God, then you, hopefully you're going to stay on the right road. You're going to see the, the dangers ahead, you're not going to cross over the wrong side of the road, but you're going to keep going. But that's kind of like, you know, preventative to keep you going. And God's provided his words so that we can be guided through. So the word of God guides us through. If you read the word, you know where you're going. And it's good to read, you can't get enough of God's word. And you can't get enough of fellowship. And you can't get enough of eating together, which is what we were doing on Friday. You can't get enough of prayer. And we're going to just round it out today with prayer and some thoughts on prayer. Um, but before we do, that's what Percy Shaw uh, came up with, cat size. But they got a bit developed over the years. Um, and nowadays, we got this, apparently. No, that's the road that they're on, sorry. Then the next one, there we are. Now those creatures are a bit developed. And apparently this is what they can do. In addition to pa passively reflecting light up to 80 metres, the studs can actively project light of different colours that's detectable out, up to 1,000 metres. When a stud detects fog, it can emit a flashing white light. When it detects a significant drop in temperature, it can emit blue light to indicate the possibility of ice. In hazardous situations, the studs can leave a trail of orange lights behind the passing vehicles to warn them against going too closely. Studs can even communicate with each other so that, for instance, a vehicle detected on the wrong side of the road can trigger red warning lights in the studs when there's a blind corner. That's <laughs> Nowadays, with technology, you think, well, everything's possible, isn't it? Well, with God's word, everything is possible. You know, God's word isn't just preventative so that you won't go off the path. It's also active and, in, and gives you incentive for life. It gives you reason for living. It does a huge amount more. A man thinks he's pretty clever doing all that, which he is actually, but that's because he's been created in the image of God and God's even more clever. And he's well able to not just stop you from going off the road, but to give you lots of incentive to do many, many things. And so reading God's word and fellowshipping together and breaking bread and praying Doing all of that, we advance. As long as we are doing it, we will advance. If we stagnate, that's because we're not doing any of that. And we will stagnate, and we may not even go in the right direction. What's the next picture? There was just a picture of the road with those, some of the markings on it. And that's not quite been developed yet. <laughs> You're probably thinking, where do you see that? Well, I couldn't find any example, but it's just in someone's mind it's going to be developed. But there are things that God's given to you and to me that haven't yet been developed. 
and God wants you to develop them. Things that he's said to you and you think, well, nobody else is doing that. Don't get frightened if nobody else is doing it. People love to follow other people, just as safety, isn't it? You know, you follow it. You don't want to do anything new because it's not safe. It's not safe. What Jesus did wasn't safe. What the disciples did wasn't safe. And what you're going to do won't be safe if it's from God. But it'll be exciting. It'll be right. It'll be, it'll be very productive and fruitful. God's always lighting up our path and uh, his spirit is warning us when it gets foggy or there are hazards ahead. But he does a lot more than that. He, he gives us drive, creativity. You've got so much creativity in your brain because it's the mind of Christ. Let's start using it. The Word of God tells me all that, and it tells you all that if you read it. I just want to look, focus on prayer and just to think about prayer and hopefully give it a dimension. Certainly for me, I, I'm still learning, but I didn't realise exactly what prayer was, and I still don't. But listen to this. This is Jesus praying, and it's Luke chapter 6, verse 12. One of those days, Jesus went to a mountainside to pray and spent all night praying to God. When morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them, whom he also designated apostles. Simon, who was named Peter, his brother Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon, who was called the Zealot, Judas, son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became his betrayer. I just wanted to think about this for a minute. When Jesus was praying all night, what was happening up here? When you're praying with a group of people, in this case Jesus on his own, when you're praying on your own or with a group of people, what's happening? I can imagine Jesus sort of, he was, he was praying and he was thinking, God, who is it going to be? Which of my twelve disciples? He wasn't just sort of saying, waiting for the revelation to fall down from heaven. Oh, there's James. I know him. Oh, there's Peter. I know him. It wasn't like that. All night praying, it was because he was thinking. And when you're praying and I'm thinking, I'm praying, I'm thinking. I'm saying, well, God, you know, what, what is right about this? What is wrong? It's, it's a combination. Because very often I used to think, well, I'll have a chat with somebody and then we'll pray at the end. It's the right thing to do, isn't it? Pray at the end. You know, oh, we pray. We did our prayer bit. That's not what Jesus did here. He was thinking and praying together. You can imagine he was thinking, yeah, okay, uh, God's told me that, I'm not quite sure how it works in the Trinity, but, you know, he was thinking, he is God. Uh, he was talking to his father, so it was all happening, let's put it that way. Um, none of us, it's a bit of a mystery, really, the Trinity, isn't it? But it was all happening, and, and he thought, the first one he seemed to think was Simon. I've got to have Simon. He's such an idiot and he's going to be really useful. And if you ever watch The Chosen, which some of you may not like, but those of us who like The Chosen, Peter's painted so amazingly. And, uh, well, in the Bible it's there, isn't it? Peter's, uh, you know, the first one to do everything, isn't he? First one to jump out the boat, first one to say, oh, you can't do that, Lord, that's not right, you know. And the uh, first one to speak out. If you want to be useful for God, be a Peter. Speak out. Don't worry too much about the fact that you might say something wrong because he said lots of things wrong but if he didn't say something wrong he wouldn't have said something right is that right if you don't speak if you're not sure do it okay if it's going to be falling off a precipice that's different isn't it uh, you you've got to know God's word basically you won't fall off the precipice if you know God's word the more you know God's word the safer you will be but also as we just looked at the more creative you can be so the safety really comes first. It's obviously no good if you fall off the road and that's it, you know, kaput. But, so keep safe. But after that, we need to go a bit further than just safety. We're going to go through life just to be safe. I don't want to go through life to be safe. I want to be saved, that's different. But to be safe in the sense of, you know, the disciples, when Jesus called Peter, it was calling him to his death, wasn't it? Basically, he was called to his death. Follow me. Follow me to the cross. That's what it meant. So following Jesus is not a safe place in that sense. It's safe because you're going to have eternal life. But it's not safe in the sense that you're going to have a, 
you know, people will judge you, criticise you. In fact, one of the Beatitudes says, blessed are you when you are criticised for me, my name's sake. Great is your reward in heaven. So we don't want to be safe in that sense. We want to be safe to be saved, to belong to God, to not deviate from that narrow path of following Jesus Christ. So he wanted Simon, that's the first one. I'm sure Simon's the right one, definitely going for Simon. He's just so weird, he's going to be the right one in the kingdom of God. Ever seen a Christian who looks a bit weird? Now, I don't mean weird in the wrong sense, but, you know, they just go for it. Why do they do that? Why does my wife talk to ladies at the supermarket till? You know, at first it used to embarrass me, because every time she would be get at the supermarket till, she said, you know, do you know Jesus? And, you know, it's, it's nothing to do with what's going on. The poor lady, you know. And I was thinking, I'm very English, so I was thinking, well, <laughs> you know, it's trying to hide in the bags. Uh, it's, it's really, it was difficult, but now I'm used to it. I almost do it myself, but she's still more bold than I am. But, you know, she gives out cards to everybody. Why? Because you never know when the seed's going to produce something. And she did have a word in her life when she was very young, spoken to her by our original leader called Papi Prados, that's uh, Mami Prados' husband, who said to her, who said to her, God wants you to speak to somebody about Jesus every day. So she just kept to that. So it's specific for her, but I think for you and me, we need to get into that too, don't we? Even though we're shy. If we're British, we're very shy. But I'm going to get into that, uh, and I'm going to try and, try and speak to people every day. Well, Peter's brother, Andrew, he thought, well, well, he's his brother. We'll have him along. And, you know, actually... In, in, in The Chosen, it shows that Andrew kind of like followed John and anyway, sorry about The Chosen, but I just like The Chosen. They're putting episode three out soon, aren't they, or season three. James, well, we know how useful James was, don't we? Well, there were several Jameses, by the way, in the Bible, so this is one of the Jameses, and I think he was probably, um, he, he was probably the one, <laughs> I get mixed up myself, because there, there's several opinions as to which James is which, but anyway, he's one of the Jameses, let's just leave it at that. John, we know, John, yeah, I definitely have John because John is just such a loving kind of character and we know that John is always talking about loving one another and uh, so he developed his character in that. Philip, an evangelist, wasn't he? Bartholomew, not quite sure what he did, but uh, Matthew Thomas. Uh, some people seem to make up the numbers. Matthew didn't. I mean, Matthew was obviously very important. Well, they're all important. What I mean is some people make up the numbers, but you're still important. You need to, you need to be 12. You know, when they, when they ended up with only 11 of them because of what Judas did, and by the way, Jesus choosing Judas can't have been very easy, can it? He must have been saying, God, you really want Judas? He seems to be a bit of a slimy character to me. But if you say so, I don't understand that really. And then maybe he did. This is God. This is the Trinity. I'm not saying I knew what went on, but Jesus spent all night thinking and praying. So when we pray, we think. And that's one of the key things I want to leave with you. When you're praying, you're not praying at the end of a chat and then a little prayer and that's it. No, when you're praying, we're thinking. So when we pray together, we're thinking together. When you're praying on your own, you're thinking. All night maybe thinking and praying, because it's an important decision. Basically, this was a very important decision, probably the most important decision. Who's going to be the 12? So all night, praying, thinking. Matthew, we know. Thomas, we know that he, he doubted, didn't he? Then James, the son of Alphaeus, another James, and Simon, who was called the Zealot, and Judas, and so on. Uh, and every one of them was important and would be really crucial to the ministry, even though we don't hear too much about some of them. They're all crucial. They're all chosen very carefully. God's chosen you very carefully. He's chosen you to be his disciple. What for? We've only got one life. I've only got one life. How are we going to use it? Are we going to battle through? Because we have battles, don't we? We're going to let the enemy take over or we're going to battle through and in the morning get up and come to the men's uh, theology time on, at 6.30 in the morning on Wednesday. Are we going to get up early and, uh, are we going to get up early and, and read God's word? Are we going to get up early and, and say, God, I just want you to use me today. Forget about yesterday and tomorrow because that's not here yet. 
But today, use me, Lord. Use me in every way you possibly can because I just want to serve you. And if we do that, we'll move forward. We won't go along the road if we're not going forwards, will we? So we need to be moving forward. I just want to now look at a prayer that was, it was a corporate prayer because we looked at Jesus on his own. Now I'm going to look at the disciples together, which is Acts chapter 4. This is one of two occasions I found in Acts where they're all praying together. On the release of Peter and... Uh, on their release, Peter and John went back to the people and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together and prayed to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations raise and the people's plot in vain? It seems like they're reasoning with God, isn't it, here? And that's a good thing to do when you're praying. Kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus. Interesting prayer. Can you imagine praying like this in a prayer meeting? You're talking to God. I think there's a lot for us to discover in prayer, isn't there? Because this is an example put in the scriptures for us to learn how to pray. Now consider their threats and enable your servant to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. I think it's really important that we're having this prayer time before the meeting. It's going to grow, that prayer time, that's just half past 10 to 11 if you can join it, get here a bit earlier, join the prayer time, it's going to be really important because look what happens after they pray. And after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. So if we pray a prayer that really is after God's heart, well basically this was, you know, enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness, that must have really touched God's heart. You say, yes, I'm going to do that. Pow! And he enables, the, he enables them to speak the, prayer, the place. And where, the, where they were meeting was shaken. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. It's really important to be filled with the Holy Spirit again and again and again and again so that we can boldly go. In fact, it actually says in Acts chapter 1, you will receive boldness when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. So really cry out to God. And together... Let's cry out to God. Let's use those times before the meeting to cry out to God. Don't worry about, you know, we talked about Simon earlier on being a bit of a, an eccentric. God likes eccentrics. Basic eccentric means ex, out of the centre. doesn't mean you're going to be stupid. It means you don't mind being different. You don't mind praying strongly. You don't mind other people <coughs> thinking you're a bit strange. As I said at the beginning... It's so easy to want to conform, to want to be, you know, I'm all right, I'm a good Christian, kind of. I think God hates that. We know God hates that because if we look at God's attitude towards the woman caught in adultery with the Pharisees saying, look, this is wrong, isn't it? She should be stoned. The word of God says so. Look at Jesus' attitude to that. Let him who is without sin first cast the first stone. He's not interested in anything except mercy and grace. And then he talks to the lady and says, look, they're not condemning you. I don't condemn you either. Go and sin no more. Why? Not because she was doing the right thing. Quite the opposite. She was doing the wrong thing. But God is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and swift to love. Amen? Mm. That's our God. That's our God. So let's, let's, be, let's be bold and confident. Let's not be stingy and, and all tight. And we've got to be all right. He hates, God hates it, people, or hates us when we, and me included, when we are trying to sort of get it all right. You understand what I mean? It's not that we don't want to be right, we do want to be right, but we don't want to stop it from uh, uh, living boldly. And Peter was, understood that, didn't he? He didn't mind going out the boat, he didn't, he didn't mind sort of standing up on the day of Pentecost. He was willing to stand up and say, why am I standing here? I haven't got, I'm not very good, but I'm going to go for it. 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 Are you going to go for it? So I just want to sum up those four things we've been looking at 
on the theme of how to restore your first love. Anybody lost their first love? I lose my first love frequently and I just need to restore these things. They are the word of God, uh, fellowship, breaking of bread and prayer. So let's just go for those things. I, I've just spoken a little bit about them. You can meditate and think much more about them and just get your mind into those four things. You've lost your love, you've lost your incentive, you've lost your drive. Well, read the word of God, have fellowship together, eat together and pray together. And mainly it means pray together because this was in Acts chapter 2, if you remember, they dedicated themselves to those four things. So let's dedicate ourselves to those four things. Amen.